Good evening. Good to see everyone back out this evening. I tell you what, I'm just happy to be here, folks. I'm glad to be here. It's the place to be, right here, where the Word of God is te taught and preached. And I thank the Lord for that. Brother Greg Chapman, would you lead us in prayer, please? Yes. Yes. We have so much to be thankful for. Lord. Even in the challenging times that we're in, Lord, I pray now that you'll come into this house tonight, that your, that your word will be preached. I know that there are people in this house tonight, Lord, that have needs. They're here, Lord, to, to seek your blessing, to seek your help, to seek the peace that you can give to us. I pray, Lord, that you'll meet with our needs tonight, Lord. And even those that aren't in the house with us here tonight, we love you. Amen. If you would stand and get your church hymnal tonight, let's turn to page number 92. This is all of our chances to be a part of this service, folks. Just sing as unto the Lord. Amen. Page 92, just a little talk with Jesus. I once was lost in sin and Jesus took me in. And then a little light from heaven filled my soul Made my heart in love and wrote my name above And just a little talk with Jesus made me whole Now let us have a little talk with Jesus Tell him all about our trouble Hear our faintest cry makes it right Sometimes my past seems drear without a real cheer And then a cloud of late made out the light of day The midst of sin may rise and hide the starry sky But just a little talk with Jesus clears the way Now let us have a little talk with Jesus all about our troubles, hear our faintest cries, answer by and by, till a little prayer will turn in, though a little fire is burning, we'll find a little talk with Jesus makes it right. I may have doubts and fears, my eyes be filled with tears, Jesus is a friend who watches day and night. number 101 at the bottom of the page is blood is on my soul 101 <clears throat> <clears throat> I rest securely in 
today into what the Romans had to say about Christ and our faith 2,000 years ago and said we were nuts. That's what they said, essentially. Yeah. Weird cult that we were. I'm glad, aren't you, that he's with us tonight? He said, if I'm because I live, you shall live also. Amen. You see, the Roman Empire is long gone, but the church of God is still here. Amen. Well, it's good to have everybody. The visitors with us tonight. We're glad to have you. I want you to make yourself right at home. As I'm sure you've noticed outside, we're approaching the winter solstice. Days are getting shorter. And uh, not a thing I can do about it. You just have to bear with it and live with it. Amen. Aren't you glad you're not above the Arctic Circle? You have times up there when you don't see any daylight. Amen. All right. Well, I'll tell you what let's do. If you have your Bible, turn to the book of John, chapter number 2, verse 11 with me tonight, please. John 2, 11. John 2, 11, it says, This beginning of miracles did Jesus in Cana of Galilee and manifested forth his glory, and his disciples believed on him. Father, bless this blessed book now. In thy name I pray. Amen. Every time you go to the Holy Land, they'll take you by this place. And, of course, they have a little place uh, built up there, which represents where he turned the water into wine. And according to the Apostle John, that was the beginning of his miracles. And he counts them. There are seven of them in the Gospel of John, seven miracles, which, of course, in the Scripture is the number of completion, divine perfection. You can't get any better than seven. And so the Lord Jesus Christ, Gematria, the number of his name, they call it Gematria. Uh, it's a Latin and a, and a, and a Greek term. Uh, the numerical value of his name is 888. And eight in the Bible, of course, coming after seven means a new beginning, a new beginning, a new beginning. So the Lord Jesus Christ is not in these first seven sign miracles they're called signs he's not in them because he's implied to be the eighth because of his resurrection from the dead that gives us eight miracles in the gospel of john and of course the last is the greatest because without the resurrection of the lord jesus everything else would be null and void be vain christ be not risen paul said in first corinthians 15 then your faith is vain and your loved ones are perished and you talk about something that would take all your joy away and all your hope away and put you out here where there's so many people tonight, you'd have nothing. And if you've taken a mother, father, husband, wife, a child, whatever, and you'd laid their body in the graveyard, you'll never see them again, according to the uh, pagan who doesn't believe the Bible. But we will, because to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. These seven miracles, he turned water to wine, he healed the nobleman's son, 
He, uh, he healed a man at uh, the pool of Bethesda, fed 5,000. He walked on the sea, and then he healed a man that was born blind. And there's only one raising of the dead in the Gospel of John, and that's found in John 11, when he raises Lazarus from the dead. Now, I want you to turn to John chapter number 5 and verse number 26, and we'll see what he's trying to say to us about this. John 5, 26. In John chapter number 5 and verse number 26. For as the Father hath life in himself, so hath he given to the Son to have life in himself. Now let's stop there just a moment because these are powerful statements. God the Father, uh, as the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, created. They brought into existence everything that exists. The Hebrew word for create in Genesis 1-1 is bara. And it means to bring into existence without the presence of anything, simply by the power of the spoken word of God. He created. All living things can trace their life back to God. There is no life apart from God. None. It does not exist. You can be certain of this. As far as they go in this universe, makes no difference. There will be no life there. The only life is the life of God. This is every living creature that has ever or ever will draw the breath of life owes its life to Almighty God, the Creator. But the Lord Jesus makes a statement here that begins to make you think. In John chapter number 5 and verse number 26, look what he said. For as the Father hath life in himself, so this is the creation, he's the Creator, so hath he given to the Son to have life in himself. In plain words, the Lord Jesus Christ now becomes the source of life. He come, becomes the source of life as the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, when everything was created, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost worked in unison as the Creator. But now the God-man, the Lord Jesus Christ, has life in himself that was not present before. And so what life is that? That will be the life of the resurrection from the dead to gain power and authority over the dead. And here's how it works. If you have the Lord Jesus Christ, you have redemption. If you have the Lord Jesus Christ, you have salvation. You see, redemption and salvation and justification are all elements of eternal life. So the Bible said that he that hath the Son hath life. And he that hath not the Son hath not life. 1 John chapter 5. So the Lord Jesus Christ says in John chapter number 11, Lazarus come forth. To the women, he said, I am the resurrection and the life. Now, this complements what was said here in John 5. Let's go back and read it again. For as the Father hath given life in him, for as the Father hath life in himself, so hath he given to the Son to have life in himself, and hath given him authority to execute all judgment also, because he is. The son of man. Now watch this. Marvel not at this. For the hour is coming. In the which all that are in the grave. Shall hear his voice. So there is a grave for every human being. That has ever lived. There will be a marker somewhere. There will be a place. Where they come forth. It says in verse 28. The hour is coming. In which all that are in the graves. Shall hear his voice. Whose voice? the voice of the Son of Man, and shall come forth. They that have done good to the resurrection of life, and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. Look at the book of Daniel. The book of Daniel, last chapter. Daniel chapter number 12. And verse number 2. Daniel 12, 2. And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. Note carefully the everlasting. Once you die without Christ, you're dead without Christ, okay? That's what that means. And that in itself is everlasting. That'll be forever because it won't change. So when the Bible talks about eternal and everlasting, it's talking about something that is going to happen that you have no control over whatsoever. 
that hear the voice of the Son of God and come forth. You see, he's the Redeemer. He's the Savior. He's the one who justifies. He's the one who sanctifies. He's the one who brings you to God. So he says, God hath given me life that is in myself. So God no longer gives you life through Christ. No. Christ gives you life originating in himself. Now, <laughs> meditate on that for a little while. The life of eternal life is not a, you know, have, we have what's called the chain of command, the military. Any military knows that. And when you break the chain of command, you're in big trouble. And so the chain of command simply means that you answer to the one right above you, and they answer to the one right above them, and so forth. So what you have here is that God the Father answers to no one. No one. Because he's the Almighty. But now he says the Son answers to no one either. The Father giveth life because he is life and the source of life. But the Son now is life and the source of life. So being the source of life, it forces you to say, well, what are we talking about here? You mean to tell me that the Son can give me life that the Father could not have given me? The Father could, have, could keep you in existence forever. That's no problem there whatsoever. But there's only one, just one, that can give you everlasting eternal life, which is his life that he wrought when God raised him from the dead. And when he raised him from the dead, he became victor over death, hell, and the grave. This is why it's so important to understand. Eternal life is not some catechism that you keep. It's not some good works that you keep in life. And all of these things, and many of them in their place, are good things. No question about that. But that will not save you. The only one that can save you is life. You have to receive life. If you don't receive life, you have death. Well, what do you mean receive? Christ is life. <laughs> Once you've received him, you've received life. This is why John says, He that hath the Son hath salvation. Life. Salvation is an element of life. Life in its purest form, too. Because John's gospel is the only one that mentions the new birth. And they are born of the spirit. The soul is saved and the body is a vehicle you use for a while. And then discharge it. Appreciate it. You served me well. See you later, alligator. <laughs> but the spirit has been born of the spirit of God. Can't explain that because I don't know the essence of God. I don't know it. I don't know the essence of a spirit. Nobody does. It's one of those mysteries that God has allowed us to have and... And truth of the matter is, doesn't, uh, doesn't it kind of uh, intrigue you that there are mysteries that we don't know? I mean, doesn't it really? It does me. It, you know, when you ever meet up with somebody who's mastered the Bible, you're looking at somebody who's uh, lost cog or two. There is no such thing as mastering a living book. Because the Bible's alive. Now think about that. It's alive. Word of God is quick. It's alive. And so we have received the son, we have received life. All right? If you lose the son, you lose life. So is there anywhere in the New Testament that tells you you can lose the son? No, you can't lose him. This is why I believe in eternal life. And John's gospel is the one who teaches eternal life. For the father hath you in his hand, and no man can pluck you from that hand. So the Gospel of John, being unique, as I've told you a thousand times before, gives us a picture of something that is altogether different than anything else. And that is that in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, we have the Son of Man receiving what God gave him and working these miracles out on earth as they lead to the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God. But there's some things that John doesn't mention, and we'll see why. John doesn't mention some of these things. All right. Now, here's some of them that John uh, does not mention. Let's see if we can find them somewhere in here. We've got some notes. Here they are. John does not mention a genealogy because he's not interested in the manhood of Christ. In the beginning was the word, Lagos, and the word was with God, and the word was a God. I had a Jehovah's Witness tell me that one time. came to my door. 
and said, there's no definite article in the Greek. I said, make any difference? He's still God. He says, no, he's not. I said, yes, he is. And so we went back and forth and back and forth there for about 15, 20 minutes. And I've only argued with Jehovah's Witnesses about two or three times. You're wasting your time. You're wasting your time. I'm telling you right now, they're brainwashed and they deny the deity of Christ. There is no genealogy. There's something else that Gospel of John doesn't have, a baptism. You remember the baptism? Holy Spirit comes down. This is my beloved son whom I'm well pleased. He goes into the wilderness for 40 days. Well, the synoptic gospels refer to that, not John. Why not John? Because the, gospel, the, the, the anointing, the, 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 uh, the baptism was the time of anointing when the Holy Spirit came down as a dove and did not anoint Christ as he anointed the rest of us. He didn't anoint him by measure. He anointed him without measure. In other words, he could, compl- he could receive the full complement of the power of God administered through the Holy Spirit. The m- God, okay, doesn't need to receive anything. And this is John pointing you to the fact that the Lord Jesus Christ is God. Okay, so he's emphasizing the Godhood of Christ. And the temptation is not mentioned in the Gospel of John. 40 days in the wilderness, trying him. Not mentioned in John. John wants to raise you up above that, and he wants to tell you this. What does James say about being tempted? It says plainly that you can't tempt God. God's not tempted, cannot be tempted, right? So the God-man, the God-man who was hammering out a perfection and righteousness with his life on this earth had to endure the temptation See, tempted, tested in all points like as we are, yet without sin. But you cannot tempt God. And so the Apostle John, when he writes the Gospel of John, temptation's gone. It's not in there. The transfiguration is not in there. You'd think something like the transfiguration would be that important, wouldn't you? But you see, the transfiguration points forward to the reign, the righteous reign of the Son of Man who has earned. Listen. Everything Christ as the Son of Man will ever receive, he receives it because he earns it. And that's a hard thing for us to understand because there's so many people trying to earn it themselves. And you can't earn it, but he did because he was perfect. And there's only been one perfect one. He bought it and he paid for it and he earned it with his sinless, perfect life. So the transfiguration points forward to the time when the man who earned it will sit on the throne in Jerusalem. Amen. So you believe all that stuff, preacher? I believe it like you would believe I believe it. I believe every bit of it. I believe the Bible. (laughs) Amen. Amen. I don't waste any time trying to critique the Scripture. If you just read the Bible the right way, it'll critique you. (laughs) Amen. The word critique comes from the Greek word discerner, kritikos. Kritikos. See, that just comes right over into English as critique. Well, in, in, the, in the New Testament, it says he is a discerner, discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. He is a critique of the thoughts and intents of the heart. And he is. But how does he do that? A dead book can't do that. See, the word of God is quick, powerful, sharp, and the any two-edged sword, piercing even the dividing center, soul, and spirit. And is a, is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. The heart is desperately wicked. Who can know it? I, the Lord... Try the heart, I try the reins, even to give every man according to his way and according to the fruit of his doing. There is no coming of the Son of Man in the Gospel of John. No, it's not in there. No coming of the Son of Man. Even though the Son of Man is mentioned time and again in the Gospel of John, the Gospel of John is looking to the deity, the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. No No parables. In the Gospel of John, Uh, you know, I've told you before. So I was taught a parable is just a is just a heaven is just an earthly event with a heavenly meaning, something like that. That's all right as far as it goes, but it doesn't go near as far enough. Look at Matthew chapter thirteen, and these things are important. Matthew chapter thirteen. Matthew 13, 3. 
All right, here we go. Matthew 13, 3, verse 1. The same day went Jesus out of the house, sat by the seaside. And this, of course, is symbolic, going out of the house. And great multitudes gathered together to him, so that he went into the ship and sat, and the whole multitude stood on the shore. And he spake many things unto them in parables. Here's the first time it shows up. Notice the context of why it shows up, saying, Behold, a sower went forth to sow. Now what follows are the parables, but I want you to look at verse number 10. Verse 10, John 13, uh, Matthew 13, verse 10. The disciples came and said to him, Why speakest thou unto them in parables? Why is this? Why all of a sudden? I mean, here you've been standing and preaching all this time, and now all of a sudden you go into this this mysterious, mystical type teaching. And here's what he said to them. Verse 11, he answered, said to them, because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it is not given. That's heavy duty stuff. I'll not spend a lot of time with it, but that's strong. That helps you understand that you can't just cherry pick the Bible, create your own little list of doctrines and cherry pick the Bible and make them line up with what you believe. It doesn't work that way. You have to read the Bible and take it as the way it says it. You have to read it and take it for what it says. The Bible is a living book and it's the word of God. Being the word of God is the mind of God. So there's a reason for the parables, but there's no parables in the gospel of John. Why? Because the kingdom of heaven, the earthly kingdom of the Jewish Messiah and the Jews is gone. Now we've moved into the age of grace We've moved into the age of the church. We've moved into the time where there is bond or free, Jew or Gentile, red, yellow, black and white, doesn't exist in the sight of God. Now, anybody, anywhere, at any time can, can freely receive eternal life from the Father through the Son. He's the giver of life. That's where we are. That's why there's no parables. And then, of course, the word believe shows up over and over and over and over and over in the book of John. And the reason it does is because we have so many different elements of belief. Notice that there are seven sign miracles in the belief. Seven sign miracles. Now, how many days were there in creation? Mm -hmm. Six days and the seventh day rested, right? So that perfected it. The creation was finished. There was no more to create. That was it. Seven days and it was done. That meant that the eighth day would be on a what? What would be the eighth day? What's the first day of the week? All right. So the last day of the week would be Saturday. And what day would that be? Seventh day. So what would the eighth day be? It'd be Sunday again. That's your eighth day. That's when you make a new beginning. You start over again. This is what Christ represents. He represents a new beginning. You see? The old, for example, the first miracle in the Gospel of John is about wine, right? It's about wine. It's about wine. Did you know the Lord taught them? He says, you cannot take new wine and put it in old bottles. You can't do it. If you take new wine, put it in old bottles, obviously it'll bust the bottle, okay? So you have to put new wine in new bottles. So he starts off the sign gifts of John with new wine. Therefore, he's saying everything is going to be new. Now, you remember the book of Revelation, it says, and I make all things new. The old order has passed away. And it's amazing, the first miracle of John, and John wants you to know this is the beginning of miracles. It, uh, it, uh, it, it's about wine. Did you know what the last thing Christ said in the Gospel of John? The last thing he said on the cross. What was it? What was the last thing he said on the cross? Somebody said it. It's finished. Exactly. It's finished. See, that's what John wants you to know. He wants you to understand. The work is done now. It's finished. This is, this is why if, if it's not finished, what do you believe? You don't, you, can't, you don't have any faith to connect with anything. If it's ongoing, hope for a good end. No. If it's finished then my faith is in what's finished. And how many times you hear it said, I believe in the finished work of the cross of Calvary. Well, you've heard it a thousand times, and it's a good, it's a good saying because it bears witness to the finishing. The, word, the, 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 the work is complete. The word finish, all you've got to do sometimes is take a word 
and trace it in the Bible and see the different translations of it, that same word throughout the New Testament. For example, in John chapter 19, verse 30, the word is translated, it is finished. But in Matthew chapter number 11 and verse 1, it's translated, make an end. Matthew 13, it's, finish, it's translated, finish. Revelation 20, verse 7, translated, expire. And then fulfill. And then fill up. And then accomplish. And then perform. And then pay. So what's that mean? That means in every sense of the word that could possibly have any meaning, it's paid for, it's finished, it's done. You can't add anything to the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I'll tell you, that's one of the greatest messages you can get out to all religions. You can because there's a bunch of churches out here that don't believe that. Oh, I believe in Christ. He's the Savior. Glory to God. Hallelujah. But if you could get the butt away from them, you'd be all right, wouldn't you? If you could just get them to finish with Christ, then you got everything. And, but it's the problem is you start adding to, uh, to what's finished. Now, here's some of the things that are finished. Okay? Some of them. The fulfillment of all scripture of the sufferings of Christ is finished. It's finished. The Bible said he died in weakness. When he comes again, and the scripture also says we no longer know him after the flesh. In other words, he's not suffering anymore. No more suffering. Uh, he defeated Satan. He put an end to him. I know he still exists, but his power has been zapped. By the blood of Christ. A Christian has absolute power over Satan. If you are a believer and you know how to plead the blood of Christ. You can come to Satan and say. The Lord rebuke thee Satan. Like Michael did to him. And he has to go. He broke down the middle wall of partition. That separated. The middle wall of partition. No longer do you have Gentiles and Jews. The Bible said in twain he should make one new man. Of twain. In other words, the general, gen gene uh, uh, generic term is Jew and Gentile. You don't, get, you, don't, you don't have to get into all of the races and everything. And so Jew and Gentile represent the twain. And the twain become one man in Christ Jesus. There's not a part of Christ for the Jew and a part of Christ for the Gentile and part of Christ for this and that. No. Once you are in Christ, all of that is gone. It's over with. It's finished. Paid for. The way to a personal access to God was finished at the cross. You have a personal access. Amen. Thankful for the high priest and what he could do with our Lord Jesus is the priesthood of Melchizedek. And the priesthood of Melchizedek no longer offers any sacrifices. There's not a one of them in there. Why? He's the sacrifice. And the priest had to approach God on the sacrifice that was given by somebody else. The Lord Jesus Christ approaches God by the himself. And God the Father had to either accept or reject the Son of God. What did he do? He accepted him. He did. The Lord said unto my Lord, sit thou at my right hand. He accepted him. Uh, he uh, put an end to the reign of death. Christians aren't, uh, they're not scared to death of dying. You have the natural feelings anybody would have. For sure you do, especially if you have a family. You've got a wife, and children, and husband, and so forth. You don't want to leave them. But you're not, you're, not, you're, not, you're not put into terror at the thought that you're going to leave this world. He took away the power of sin. He broke it. Doing good will not break the power of sin. Meaning well will not break the power of sin. What will? Nothing but the blood. Amen. That's right. Nothing. And he gave us salvation. And he made peace with God. Between God and man. Isn't that a way? Wonderful thing. You say, preacher, what do you mean? God's not mad at me anymore. He's given it to the Son. Let's go back and read John again. John 5. Verse 24. Well, let's go back to verse 23. That all men should honor the Son, even as they honor the Father. He that honoreth not the Son, honoreth not the Father, which hath sent him. The word sent means the apostle. That's what the word apostle is sent. That's what it means. Verily, verily, I say unto you, 
He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life. Do you believe that? Don't complicate it. Don't, don't try to make something out of it that it's not. You believe his word? You honor the Father? Then here's what he said. Hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation. Now notice carefully, but is passed from death unto life. This is not a process. This is an absolute event. It's not a process. Salvation is not a process. Now sanctification on this earth through your high priest is a process. Yes. But salvation, the act of being born again, is an event that takes place in your life. And so he said, he said, this shall not come to condemnation, pass from death to life. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the hour is coming, and now is, when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God, and they that hear shall live. For as the Father hath life in himself, so hath he given to the Son to have life in himself, and hath given him authority to execute judgment. There it is. See this? God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. Therefore, all judgment has been given to the Son and hath given him authority to execute judgment because he is the Son of Man. See that? See that? He earned it. Note carefully, anything the Son of Man does, he's earning something. That may, that may be a good way to put it in context. Just read the context and everywhere it says Son of Man, that means that he's earning something. He's doing something as a man that will be rewarded. And this is what Christ did. He gave himself so we don't have to give ourselves. Even if he hadn't, even if, he, even if you could go out and be crucified, that won't pay for your sins. It won't do it. The only thing that can pay for your sins is the blood of Christ. The only thing that can cover your sins is the blood of Christ. The only thing bring you peace with God is the blood of Christ. Say, so why the blood of Christ? Because it's living blood. Well, it's dead now. No, it's still alive. You know that, uh, 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 what's his name? Uh, Wayne, uh, Ron, White. Ron White. Thank you, brother. I told you all about a year ago. He's supposed to have been underneath the Temple Mount. And he found uh, quite a thing. There's a lot involved in it. But he found blood on a stone. He took that blood to a local uh, uh, lab. And they looked at that blood. And they looked closely at that blood. And according to him now, I have no reason to doubt his word. They said back to him, said, where'd you get this blood? And he said, I got it off of a rock. They said, this blood's alive. <laughs> uh -huh. Think about it for a minute. Couldn't die. He couldn't die. It's alive. Has to be alive. And this is where I fall out big time with the preachers that say that he didn't enter in the presence of God with his blood. The blood simply represents his life. And therefore there was no blood carried by him into heaven. Hogwash. Amen. There's the blood of Christ in heaven right now at the right hand of the Father. And that's the only thing that will wash your sins away. The fact of the matter is, you get to thinking about it very deeply, folks. Think about this. You are not born again by his life. You are born again by his death and resurrection from life, from death into life. That's where the new birth takes place. And this is what it said in the book of Hebrews chapter 9. The testament is not in force without the death of the testator. Who's the testator? The Lord Jesus. So when he dies, the testament is ratified. In other words, all the signatures are put upon it. The seal is set to it. You all been somewhere. You bought a building or a court of law or whatever. And all of the official things are done to it. And now it's, it's, it has the power of law behind it. That's exactly what happened when Christ died on the cross and rose from the dead. God put the seal of legality to it and it cannot be changed. Cannot be changed. So the Gospel of John is quite a thing. I love the Gospel of John. I love Matthew, Mark, and Luke too. If I understand Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and we should pray that we understand it, it'll help us understand John better. All Scripture, all Scripture complements other Scripture. You don't have anything as a rogue book in the Bible. 
All scriptures interwoven and every bit of it complements itself because it's a living book. Amen. And no one book in the Bible is greater than another book in the Bible. They all have their rightful place. Amen. Father, thank you, Lord, for a little time we have tonight to study the Bible. I pray it's been a blessing. I pray, Heavenly Father, we, if we don't get anything else from this lesson, we get the fact that Christ is life. He is life. If we have him, we have life. In Jesus' name, amen. Have we got anybody singing tonight? Let's see. Day's, day's 27th, is it? Jesse Howe. There he is.
That is beautiful. It is. violin was beautiful too yes it was yes it was well we have any prayer requests tonight yes ma'am Okay, brother. Who's this now? Oh, Randy Bain. No, I didn't know that. All right. Amen. Okay, anybody else? Yes, sir. Today, a constitutional lawyer named Michael Yoder filed a lawsuit in the District of Columbia against the president and 19 other members of his cabinet uh, for the vaccine mandates against military and all federal employers and civilian contractors. And as of about 44 minutes ago, a judge Okay. To to this All right. So Words won't get it. They have to put it in writing. Yes, okay. Be All right. All right. Anybody else? Yes, ma'am. He's been pretty sick for the last few days. All right, amen. Somebody up in here? Yes, sir. You sure remember Sonny and Patricia? Yes. Is he still on the ventilator? Do you know? Good. Good. Okay. All right. Anybody else? Yes, ma'am. She's not married, and you know she's picking up her children, and it's just 
Oh, I know. Yeah, I know. You'd be surprised how many grandparents are raising their grandchildren. Many. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, I'm sure. Amen. Okay, anybody else? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Just a phrase. I want to thank everybody for coming. My little boy, he had COVID a couple weeks ago. Good, good, good. All right, yes, ma'am. Okay, you said the clerk was murdered. I think I saw that on the news. Yeah, yeah. Okay. All right, anybody else? Yes, sir? Well, I was talking to uh, uh, Brother Barry's wife right over here. She said that uh, he has, I asked her, I said, does he feel safe? Maybe you want to tell him. They've had over 800 this year, oh, more than twice as many uh, abductions for, uh, uh, for uh, you know, what do they call it? Ransom. Ransom. Yeah. It's, a, it's turning into a real problem down there. All right. Anybody else before we pray? All right. Brother Dewey Caldwell, leave some prayer. Would you do that?
Folks, be careful. We'll, Lord willing, see you Sunday morning, 10 o'clock uh, for Sunday school. God bless you. <clears throat>